Shift Gear Podcast in Orgunska Vilsinje Fam. Which means the Shift Gear Podcast is pretty blessed, fam, in Norwegian, uh, because of our boy Tord and his uh non meta manipulation that went down yesterday. Uh so we're uh we're all Norwegian today in honor of our boy Tord. Um I just want to preface that my hat does not fit on my head. I do apologize. Um unfortunately it only comes out in kids' sizes. This hat, and apparently you can walk into any Krispy Kreme and pick up one of these. So, shout out to Krispy Kreme. I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to be wearing it like this. Like this is the way I'm supposed I think to wear. You are too. Yeah, but like it doesn't show the brand. So like I'm a big brand boy, so I'm gonna wear it like horizontally. Bro, like they're that. not they're not sponsoring us. We're just giving free promo. Yet, yet, yet. Bro. Okay. yet. We gotta manifest it. Right. Once they see the way I wear my hat, they're gonna want to sponsor us. That's fair. That's fair. So welcome back, y'all. Uh, we're here to uh, walk you through. NAIC, the biggest tournament of the year at the end of this week in New Orleans, Louisiana, which has two check-in points, which is actually really interesting. Um, one of the airport and one of the venues. So y'all better let me know how that one goes. Uh, so big, uh, big Japanese tournament this weekend. Uh, let's recap that to start and then we'll hop in. We're going to give you guys all of our personal lists. Uh, I'm not going, so I don't care. I'm going to leak everything I've ever known in my life. Uh, Kieran also doesn't care. He's going, <laughs> but he doesn't care. So he's also going to leak everything he's ever known in his life. Uh, so yeah, these are going to be our personal lists, our top three choices, our starting points of what we would kind of walk into the event with, with some rationale and, and what we think the meta is kind of going to be. So, uh, Kieran, why don't you take, take us through this, uh, Japanese journey to start off here? Yeah. Um, so they had a champions league in Japan, which is basically the equivalent to a regional. Um, and I think that was their first, uh, champions league with all the new cards from, from Farlight Masquerade. So I guess it's kind of like a precursor it gives us. Uh, a chance to look. One thing I was kind of curious about was how Raging Bolt was going to do, because it really feels like Raging Bolt was like a deck that got popular in the West before Japan got to use it in the city leagues. Um, mm-hmm. And it performed pretty well. If I had to like, have a takeaway from this tournament, it was that like, Lugia and Raging Bolt seemed to be uh, the two best performing decks. Uh, the finals was Raging Bolt and Lugia. Uh, but there's some other interesting stuff in the top 16. I don't know how much you looked, Neil. There's a Chen Pao with Palkia. Yeah. There's Ancient Vox. There's Golden Go. There was Maridon. There's Dialga. Uh, there's also a Roaring Moon with Dark Eye V-Star deck. So uh, an interesting top uh, top 16 for sure. Um, I wish for these type of tournaments we could get kind of like how Limitless does where you can get the whole day too. But we kind of mm-hmm. just have to go off the top 16, which is a smaller sample size. Um, and the Japan does best of one. Uh, so maybe that kind of like favors faster decks in their format. But I just thought it was interesting to get a peek of maybe uh, what our our format might look like next week. So, yeah, definitely some interesting stuff in there. It shows like that everything is kind of diverse. Um, I think our like at least my biggest takeaway I shouldn't speak on behalf of you, but my biggest takeaway like going into NIC is that there's no real um like set in stone BDIF at least yep. from 100%. what I've figured. Um, so that's really new in in terms of like ICs and stuff. Like we haven't seen that in a little bit. So that's gonna be really interesting to see how people kind of like tackle that. And like, I mean, you look at all the innovations from Japan too, like that Roaring Moon with Dark Rise to, I guess, take the place of Moltres by recycling Dark Patches. You look at Chen Pao with Palkia, which maybe takes the place of some turns where you no longer have a consistent barrel engine because it's getting sniped out by Dragapult. So you're just accelerating from the discard or whatever it is, right? A lot of innovations. I think we're going to see a lot of cool stuff at, uh, at NAIC this year. And uh, I think so the, the, the Tord Masterclass that just happened yesterday, I think also is going to have a big impact on what we see, uh, whether it's in favor of Dragapult or whether it's to counter Dragapult. I do think he's, his uh, impact is wide enough that we're going to see a few things go down. And I think that will change the meta a little bit from where this Japanese tournament was. Yeah, I think um, like his list from that class are probably going to circulate <laughs> throughout the community. Regardless, if you yes, I've already not. seen it. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I feel kind of weird, like leaking. I guess towards stuff because it costs money. But yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, like he talked about like which A spec he would run. He talked about like which radiant. I mean, I don't think he said anything like crazy. Um, I kind of aligned with a lot of what he was saying. Like some of the lists. Like, um, yeah. I think we'll talk about Dragapult later, Neil, because I think it's one of your choices for the event. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see if that affects the meta share at all. And I think what I'll what will be the most interesting is if it affects which version of Dragapult people play. Since I still think the community doesn't have a consensus on which one is best, I do think for at the start, everyone was like, oh, Zatu, and then everyone shifted to Pidgeot, and then like the Lost Zone version has been picking up some steam lately. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it'll be really interesting to see. So, 
Yeah, I'm also curious too is uh, to see what Tord ends up actually playing. Yeah. Uh, I, I had this conversation as well with a couple people in my circle yesterday, where I'm like, "Damn, you guys are really itchy for this master class. Like, you know, he's not going to play actually what he's saying, right?" And then I realized, like, if you think of it from a business perspective, it actually makes the most sense for him to play what he's saying because okay. he made 10k off this master class. It, it that's just as much as winning a regional. Yeah. So if he loses the trust of the people in that master class, he can't make another 10k. So. If he plays what he's talking about, he practices what he preaches, people are like, hey, I can pay this amount of money the next time an IC comes around to know exactly what Tor is going to play. Then he makes even more money, right? So yeah. I actually think he's being very genuine. Yeah, I don't think Tor's like doing malicious or anything. Like, I also don't think he's obligated to play Dragapult. Like, he's doing a class on Dragapult. No, I don't think so either. But he never said, like, oh, I'm going to play Dragapult. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even if Tor like, plays a list that he like put out there in the master class, like, he can just skill diff probably most of the way there. Um, exactly. And I think like most people, you can figure out a list like when you play against someone in a tournament, anyways. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's interesting. Like, I wonder uh, if this is just Tor's new thing. Like, every month we're gonna get a new master class. Uh, I mean, if he makes ten yeah. grand every time, like, why not? So, <laughs> it's a good source of income, dude. And like, yeah. I don't know. Like, it, I always find it interesting just to see how people behave before a tournament versus what they play, and then looking back on it and be like, okay, this guy might have manipulated. This guy did not. Um, we sat up here last time for UIC and we gave out our, our personal list and I'm pretty sure you ended up playing exactly one of the 60s. So um, I think there's different types of people. I think there's people that care a lot. There's people that don't care at all. Um, I would actually prefer, like when I think about myself as a, as a content creator, so to speak, which I know we're, we're not at that level yet, but I would actually prefer to give out my list because then people think you're not playing it, right? Like <laughs> that's kind of like the way I look at it. And, and it's just interesting to see how different people kind of go about it differently. but. Definitely a lot of good info out of that class. I think um, I think a lot of like the sequencing stuff that he did was really was really good. And if you haven't seen the VOD, I, I suggest you purchase it from him if it's still available for purchase. I'm not sure, but um, we're we're filling his bag. Not that he needs it, but you know, it was good. Definitely worthwhile. Uh, so let's get into the decks here that we have. Um, like, so we both have three decks. Two of ours were the exact same. So I pivoted my second place one to something else, which I actually believe in. So it's fine. Um, so to start, let's start with your third place. And these are our lists. We'll kind of take you through them, um, kind of like thought processes and where we think they're at. So why don't you just take us through your third place? Yeah, I mean, my third place list is just Chun Pao. Um, so the reason <laughs> it's not first is I, I just think the meta has gotten a little bit worse for it. Um, I don't know if you, if you guys watched the video on my personal YouTube this week, but I kind of broke it down where it's like uh, one of your best matchups, like Charizard, is going down a meta share, and it's probably going to be replaced by like Dragapult, which is an unfavored matchup. Um, Lugia also went from being a favored matchup to unfavored, in my opinion, just because of Legacy Energy and like Hands, and also Ursa Luna. They have like a basic that can knock out Iron Hands, which is annoying. Um, and then, yeah, also like Raging Bolt be super popular, and that's like a 50 50 matchup. So uh the deck's matchup spread has gotten worse the only reason it's third on my list is because like that's the deck i'm probably the most comfortable playing like i know for sure that's the deck i play the best um so i still have a third i probably won't play it i'm probably gonna play one of the two decks that i put ahead of it here um but yeah i just want to shout out shout out cpow uh the list is basically like the same one that like uh like reagan grant and luke's have been playing uh it's slightly different than what i've been playing this format but uh, i basically added cologne just because if you go up against any of the cornerstone Ogre Pond masks, you do need to have a counter to it. Uh, otherwise, you just get walled. And also against Dragapult, uh, you really want to start pulling off some like, turn two or even turn three like Greninja clone plays uh, to really swing that matchup. So I think it's really important in this format. So um, yeah, I don't think Chen Pao is like, a horrible play by any, by any means. I just don't think it's as strong as it was in the, cur- in the format before Twilight Masquerade. Yeah, do you think Chim Pal kind of went back towards uh, what was the format before? Uh, I think it was before Paradox when it was like kind of in like that, that tier two to tier uh, three like obscurity range. Do you think it's back there? No, I still think it was better position in that format. I just think that format people weren't playing it yet. I think we saw towards the end of that format, Chim Pal was picking up steam and seeing a lot more play. Um, mm-hmm. so I think back then, like the most popular decks were like Gardevoir and Charizard, and you actually beat both of them. Uh, but now, like the most popular decks are going to be like probably like Raging Bolt, Dragapult. I don't know what else, but like those aren't like favored matchups on on paper. So, uh, no, I'd say it's like worse than it was back then. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see someone going around with it. I feel like nobody's really accounting for it as a existing deck anymore. So, it'd be interesting. I also think that like it's the deck that 
playing having to play 70 hp pokemon hurt you the most i think um yeah. out of all the decks out there i mean i don't play the bidoofs 70 hp because i'm just like uh i don't want to like i only play two bad starters really i play the iron hands and the 70 hp fridge uh mm-hmm. i just find like if you play in stragapult like you basically have to go first to have like a really good chance um and like if the lost Sun version gets popular they're not going to attack you with dragapult right away so you have more time to evolve your bidoofs because normally they're going to target your back scalibers and try and go for eventually a turn where they can just wipe your board of that um so for me like i find it it's fine to just play the 60 hp ones i have time to evolve them i'm not too scared about tm devolution um so you i just like if you start with a a 2-8 retreat guy like it's just so annoying it like griefs your game so much and uh yeah. so like the odds if you play two bad starters it's one in uh, 12 games you start with one and if you play three bad starters if i play bdoof it's one in eight games i start with either hands two retreat fridge or two retreat bdoof uh, that's just too high for my liking, so um, I decided to to omit the 7 HP Bidoof. But yeah, we're definitely rocking the the 7 HP fridge. I, I hate that guy, but he's coming back. Uh, and yeah, the correct the correct one to play, so everybody knows, it's not the one with Collect. It's the one that does 50, uh, just because Gardevoir is popular. Uh, so you want one that can clean up like Scream Tails or or Drifloons without Bravery Charm. So uh, pro tip for you guys there. Pro tip. Yeah, yeah, you know, like, I don't know, I was thinking about it too, like, Dragapult is a lot slower than we thought as a whole, so I think that also benefits Chen Pao a little bit, benefits all these, like, little basic decks that thought they were just going to get gatekept out of playing the game, so, especially with, like, the bills that are coming out now with, like, Zatu and, and Lost Box, or whatever, like, they're they're pretty slow, they're not normally using Dragapult before turn three, so you got some time to build up, and there are some tech options, like, if you're really scared of Devo, you can play like some jank, like middle backs or something, which would be kind of jokes. I hope someone does well with middle backs, but there's uh, there's definitely some options there. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, one sorry, more go ahead. Thing I was say, one other card you can consider adding is Enhanced Tamer to like get rid of the Legacy Energy. Um, yeah. It's just a little hard if your opponent turn two hands you, which I don't know how realistic it is. So, um, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll switch back to Sea Pow at the last minute if I really don't feel comfortable with my other picks, but. Uh, for now, see powers. I've seen that show before. It's probably yeah. in the back. <laughs> yeah, fair play, fair play. Okay, well, let's hop into my number three here. So my number three is actually pretty uh, time sensitive here, but it's pretty interesting. Um, I've been playing this for about a week and a half. Uh, it's lost on Dragapult, so just what Tord kind of brought to the light. Um, I really like this deck. I think it's got a great balance of early game pressure and late game kind of sweep potential. You do have a little bit of a damage cap, of course. Um, there is a lot of reliance on you setting up math with Sableye, with uh, Dragon Ball's bent- bench damage, things like that. So there is a lot of moving parts, and sometimes you are countered by a single switch cart. But the the deck does feel overall, from the the testing that I've done, the best way to play Dragon Ball. And I know we know from history that the latest card that came out that's like cool and hip and hype is always like at the forefront of people's minds. Like they always want to either be playing that deck or have an answer to that deck. I think this is the best way to play it. Um, it combines the consistency of Lost Zone, the early game pressure of Lost Zone with like the sweet potential Dragon Ball, and you also gain Dracloak. So your Lost Zone engine is inherently better because you have a way to dig for cores, you have a way to dig for Iono, and, and you're passively drawing cards from the bench, not needing switch cards or switches or anything like that. So um, this is the list I've been rocking on your screen right now. Um, it's got a couple Ionos similar to Tord's list, and I'm surprised that it's so similar to Tord's list, to be honest, but I play a gear in there, a um, couple of her candies still. I do not have a Temple of Sinnoh, which uh, I believe should actually be in there now that uh, I've seen the rationale for it. It does make a lot of sense. So uh, Temple Sinnoh would be good here. I think you do need 4-Pof in to nest. Uh, you can go up there somewhat. But um, I do think overall the, the list is really good. I still play Prime Catcher uh, just because I think Gus is really important here. But um, yeah, it's it's a good pick. It kind of goes against my whole idea of, of ICs and not playing the most like hyped card and whatever, mm-hmm. whatever. And like, had I actually been going to any IC, maybe I probably... I don't think I would actually play this, but... Um, I do think that had the Tord Masterclass not existed, I probably would have, to be honest. Yeah, I think I've actually played a decent amount of this the past few days. Um, so I actually really like this version of the Dragapult deck. It is the one that's felt like the best to me. My one problem I have with this deck is like it's really hard to just search out my drag cloaks and Dragapults because like you don't play Ultra Ball, um, so you just have to naturally mm-hmm. like find them cycling through the deck, which can be a little tricky to be honest. Uh, you only play like two Dragapults. Um, so you gotta go really hard to find them, and like it plays, it's less turboy than a normal Lost Zone deck, obviously because you're fitting a stage two Pokemon in. 
so that's my only gripe I have with it. But I do think that Cramorant's like great. It combos really well with Dragapult to set up knockouts on just like any EX, basically. Even the 330 ones, you can just clean them up later. Um, I just I love how like well this deck can utilize Radiant Charizard. I think that is something I really really like. I think Radiant Charizard is like a fantastic card in this metagame. Um, yeah, I think one thing to talk about Neil is like the A spec choice. I think Prime Catcher for sure is good. Um, I think Reset Stamp has an argument, and I actually think Legacy Energy also has an argument in this deck. Uh, like late in the game, if you just go like Legacy Energy Charizard or even Legacy on a, a Dragapult turn into a one prizer, uh, yeah. it seems pretty strong. I haven't tested it enough. <clears throat> But that's like an idea I've seen floating around and I'm like, oh, that's actually kind of interesting. That might that might work in here. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Are you dead set on your on your prime catcher selection? You think it's by far the best? Uh, The only reason I wouldn't consider legacy energy just because I think now you need to play temple. So your temple is shutting off your own legacy, which is which can be an issue, Um, because if you play temple, you're most like, well, you could play an artisan as well or a vacuum or something, but you probably only have one other stadium bump. So there's a chance your temple kind of just gets stuck or you misuse it or whatever, whatever, and, or you trap yourself to not using your own legacy energy. So I found the prime catcher a lot of the time to be a bailout card. I think the stamp is also a bailout card. Like when your hand's kind of dead and they get a knockout, okay, whatever, I get a fresh five. Whereas prime catcher, sometimes you're starting like a Radzard you need out of the active. So they're both kind of bailout cards. So I really like them. I think legacy energy is like a kind of a win more card, which can be sick. Like that's that's awesome. Like Cramomatic was a huge win more card for a long time, and it was great, right? So there's arguments to both. It just depends on how high roll you you kind of want to be there. So yeah, this is uh I, I do like this archetype a lot. You have a decent stall matchup as well with the ability to put all your basics to the bottom of your deck with uh, airmail or what is it called? Is it called airmail? It's not called airmail. <coughs> it's called sorry recon, recon directive. Directive, yeah. Yes, yes. I choked him up by saying <laughs> airmail. That's crazy. Yeah, it's uh so you have the ability to put all your, your bad basics to the bottom as well. And like I don't even know what your bad basics are in here. I guess just Manaphy and, and Zard. So um you have the ability to do that and you're you're tearing through your deck. So I really like this build and uh I would not be surprised to see it do decently well at an ASC. Yeah, I agree. Uh I think honestly this might be the most popular drag pull version, just because you said uh I think Tord said this is the best one, so yeah, uh, this thing won't fit on my head, man. Oh my god, it's like keeps falling off my head here. You just right, your good. commitment to the bit is respected, Neil. Yeah, let's go to your number two here. Um, you had I actually don't even remember what you had. Uh, Gardevoir. Uh, was it Gardevoir? Gardevoir. Okay. Uh, so take us through your Gardevoir list real quick. Yeah, I mean, I I've been playing the unfair stamp version of Gardevoir. I think that for me is personally what i've been preferring i've played a lot of games with the irida version as well with the hyper aroma Mm -hmm. um i think my problem with the hyper aroma version is i don't really like it when i go second as much just because i don't get to evo uh when i go first the hyper aroma version feels a lot better so um yeah i just think dragapult or not dragapult to gardevoir is in a good spot uh the deck has a lot of flexibility um like it's kind of like a toolbox deck which is, is neat um, I do struggle every time I play Gardevoir. Like I've played the broken Gardevoir, and I'm like, oh, this is so so different. I know. Like with like when I, I used to have like Mirage Death and Arcana. Um, a couple callouts. Like I think you need to play in Hands Tamer if you play Gardevoir. Um, if your opponent Lugia like, hands you, you need to get rid of the Legacy right away, and then you can just scream Tail Snipe and Archaeops. I found normally I win when I pull that off. Um, I am rocking Mimikyu. I think Mimikyu is. It's just like a nice little thing to throw in the active turn one to kind of like buy yourself some time when you go first against decks that do have options like uh, Iron Hands. Uh, I'm not like dead set on that because like when you go second, you can't really retreat. You have to evo with whoever's in the active. Um, but yeah, I just think Gardevoir is a solid play. Um, not much more to say than that, Neil. Yeah, I have it at my number one, so I won't dive into it too much. And sorry, spoiler alert. But Well, just talk about uh, it now and then we'll just switch your other one to number one. Yeah, sure, we can do that. Uh, my list is a little different though, so I don't want to go into like I'll I'll touch on my list differences after. Um, we do have a couple similar things in ours. I agree with your enhanced hammer. I do not have it in my list. I was not able to find the space, but I do agree with it. Um, I think Gardevoir is in a great spot. I do also think it's been overhyped a little bit to the point where it might get yeah. counter to hell, um, which is a bit of an issue. So I'd be looking out for a lot of rogue lost vacuums, a lot of random counterplay to Gardevoir. Like I do think it's on everyone's radar now, and especially with how many good players are kind of hyping it up and, and, and how people have been going through the ranks with it a little bit. Um, the one thing I will say about this Gardevoir in, in comparison to last format Gardevoir is that this definitely does not feel 
nearly as versatile i would say like there are a lot of like counterplay that you just cannot avoid um yep. there's not a whole lot you can do about a rogue loss vacuum and counter catcher on your guard of orex and kill like there's not much you can do about that so um that part i haven't loved about the deck the deck has also felt extremely fragile on turn one which it always has been but um it also does feel a little bad now with with that and uh, there's a lot of times where I feel like I'm getting Arvin so I can get my buddy pop and Evo, whatever, but I'm not able to get a mana fee or there's some like aspect of the of the puzzle missing. So it does feel a little bit uh, tricky at times to get set up. But once you do get set up, there's uh, there's a lot of reward to it uh, for sure. And as always with Gardevoir, there's a lot of times where you're going to dig, you're not going to get what you need and you're going to lose the game because you didn't draw into your boss off your refinements or whatever. And that's just life. So. Um, yeah, I I will say one thing with the unfair stamp I found is like honestly like I feel like the card literally reads like thirty percent of the time like win the game on the spot. Um, yeah, like it's just it's just solid. Like I I really enjoy having that like out like to just like win. Um, it's also nice because like you play a bunch of Iona too, so it's like I feel like eventually I'm gonna get one of these things to stick. It just feels like also the deck now with Monkey Dory like you have so much options. Like every game I feel like I'm finding different lines like. Like ways to manipulate the damage, set up knockouts across multiple turns, like use Gardevoir as a better attacker. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think the deck, if you're a stronger player, you're willing to put in the time, it's worth it. Uh, but I do agree with you. I do think we're going to see some some teching for it. I think most people are going to be rocking either like a jamming tower or a lost vacuum uh, to help improve yeah. this matchup. And one, I guess we'll talk about it when I get to Lugia, but like, um, like jamming tower is kind of scary for this deck because I see most builds, even mine, only has one stadium. Uh, yeah. So I'm just I'm kind of considering adding a second one, or even that, like my own lost vacuum for like mirror or something, uh, just because I'm a little little weary of that. Yeah, no, I hear you. And uh, we'll we'll talk about Gardevoir a little bit more when we get to number one. So I'll, I'll leave the rest for now. Um, okay, so let's hop into my number two, which is actually Charizard, which is uh, interesting. So I think Charizard is actually in a fantastic place. Um, it is, and this has been a little bit of a common opinion for sure, but it, it's, it's been slept on quite a bit and, and people are just assuming it, it can't keep up because of the dragon Paul gatekeeping it, whatever, whatever. Um, the, the truth is that it's actually very, very far from that. And I think most people in testing for an IC have been pleasantly surprised with how strong Charizard still is. Um, this is, and, and obviously this is not going to be a 22% Charizard meta share. Like this is not what it used to be. So you're actually almost able to cut some of your mirror techs in favor of making your deck better overall. So I like that as well. I think Charizard's in a really good position. If I were an NAIC, and I would actually like heavily, heavily consider playing this. Um, just because you're you're a little bit under the radar, you in theory can check the best the best decks. Um and you can kind of go about it that way. My list on your screen right now has two lost vacuums. Uh this list is is more tested for Gardevoir, um to beat Gardevoir. It's a lot easier for Gardevoir to pull off the KO Pidgeot play now, which is really, really scary because they can just stamp, countercatcher, kill a Pidgeot. It's a little bit different to when you had to find Iono as well. So your Arvin is almost an out to you just kind of breaking out your opponent. So it it is a little scary from the Charizard side. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can really do about that. But by playing two lost vacuums and basically just hoping to outpace them, so get setting up Beeb, setting up Pidgeot, and then just hoping to outpace them is is kind of the the way of the wind there. Um, but yeah, I think Charizard's in a great spot. I think there's a lot, the, the stats of the card will keep it good until it rotates. Yep. Um, I don't think there's ever going to be a doubt about that. And playing the Mist Energy definitely helps too. Yeah, anyway, one question I wanted to ask you is about Ace Spec. So you have Maximum Belt. I've seen a lot of people I've talked yep. to have been really liking the Hero's Cape, mainly because it's really good against Lugia, for example. Um, mm -hmm. So why do you think Maximum Belt is your play here? And like, have you considered some other Ace Specs maybe? Yeah, for sure. I think I think Hero's Cape is really good. And like Pidgeot Control would also be one of my, my choices going into this event. So I just think Hero's Cape overall and like these stat boosting cards are a good card. Are, are, are good effects. Uh, the reason why I would not go for Hero's Cape right now is because of uh, Gardevoir's popularity. It kind of crossfires you, so a lot of lost vacuums are going to be teched in. Uh, so you are likely to lose your Hero's Cape a little bit more now than you would be prior. Um, I also just like the pure aggression of Max Belt. I think your your deck is just good at just blowing things up, and, and that should be what your deck does. I think the Hero's Cape does do a lot into Lugia for sure, but I think there's also probably better ways to counter Lugia as, as a Zard player. And like... Yeah. Just if you're if you're playing temples or whatever, like you want to devote that that space, then you can kind of go about it that way. So yeah. I mean, um, Max Belt doesn't do anything as guard over either. So I don't know if that's an argument for not playing. No, it doesn't. Game. It doesn't. Um, yeah, of course not. But, so what would be maybe another tech you could play for Lugia? Like, do you think? Well, you can have temples. You, your your mist definitely helps a, a tiny tiny bit um, into uh, Lost Box Dragapult. So that's kind of why that's there. 
Um, I'm trying to think of like other things you can play into Lugia. There's, I, I'm not too sure off the top of my head what I would kind of put in. I haven't really considered that as a as a crazy crazy I guess matchup hand yet. But yeah, you can play Enhanced Hammer, Temple. They're both searchable, or sorry, uh, Enhanced Hammer searchable off Arvin. Temple kind of is too with your Forest Stone and Pidgey. Um, so. Yeah, off the top of my head, I'm not too sure what else you could kind of put in there. Yeah, I guess you're also playing Kieran, so like Maximum Belt can be like plus eighty effectively. Um, yeah, which is actually pretty good. You can hit that those break points much earlier in the game. Um, I guess like near you one shot of Lu- yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was about to say you one shot Lugia, then I realized it's a V star. Yeah, no, Lugia. Gets you do one shot hands right off the right off the bat if they go aggro hands on you. I mean that kind of feels bad for them anyway, so they probably shouldn't be doing that. I've seen a lot of Wellspring mask. Yeah, I mean, so, well, Wellspring sorry, mask. Go I don't think is good. I mean, we'll talk about who gets Lugia, but uh, yeah. I don't know. I just that card's not good. Max Bell just feels like a utility card, dude. Like, it just feels like it's good yeah. into whatever you're kind of up against. And, like, Hero's Cape has an argument, and I like the Hero's Cape argument a lot. I just think there's a lot of Rogue Loss vacuum. I just think that's the... Yeah, that's I guess Maximum Belt is good against Raging Bolt. It's good against other Charizard deck. It's good against Dragapult. Uh, it just has less overall utility, which is fine if yeah. you think you're, like, finding a certain metagame. Um which I think is... Yeah, and I think I think the other option is obviously Prime Catcher as well. So that yeah. that still does exist, and I think there's some merit to that. It just depends on what you're expecting to hit, and right now the meta is so, so broad that I feel that Max Belt might be the best overall into just random whatevers, uh, whereas, like, uh, Heroes Cape, you're, you're tacking towards certain more certain things. So there's arguments to a lot of things. There's, you can play Stamp in here if you wanted to. You can play whatever the hell you want, and I think with more and more Ace Packs coming out, we're going to keep having these conversations, so that's pretty awesome. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, so let's hop in here to your number one. All right. I mean, it's boring, but I just put Lugia. Lugia bot. Boo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just think Lugia is my safest play for the tournament. I think the deck's very powerful. I think it's proven itself. I normally don't put a lot of stock in Japan, but like it's doing really well there as well. Um, yeah, I just think Legacy Energy just unlocked like a, a huge buff for this deck. Um, I think everyone is obviously aware that you can now attack with Iron Hands and even Luminion. But taking one less prize is actually insane. Like, Iron Hands is now a one-prize attacker uh, that takes two prizes, like, every single time. And if it's unchecked, it'll run away with the game. So um, I think just having the option to Iron Hands puts a lot of decks on a clock. A lot of decks can only knock out Iron Hands by using their own two prizes. Uh, so you kind of force them to do some, like, bad trades. So you can kind of initiate some nice prize trades. Uh, you still have Chinchino to just blow things up and have, like, a nice one-prize option, which I really like. I found Blood Moon has been a great card um some games you can't really afford to get those chinchinos going or you just need like you're running low on energies near the end and that card can just finish it up for you so um i will say like always the thing holding back lugia is like every game you're not getting turn two summoning star for double arc uh if you did this deck would be like by far the best um i think it's also going to see people tacking against it a little bit some enhanced hammer maybe some of those temples um so i'm actually uh, i'll say here i'm running the double jamming tower i am respecting the um Gardevoir matchup a lot. Um I do find like you if you get these to stick, like it's pretty good. Another thing is like you only play two, so it's hard, but if you draw them turn one and you put it down against Gardevoir, it's actually really hard for them to find an Evo, like or like a counter plus an Evo. So you can really slow them down if you find it early, which I would like. Um I think also like control decks and like Charizard, a lot of them are playing Hero's Cape. Um so I just think having the option to shut that off is really good. Um but yeah, like I'm also rocking like the one Carmine. I, I don't really like the card that much, but like having the option to fish for it, turn one, I left it in the deck. Um, but yeah, I just don't know. It's just Lugia. Like I know how to play Lugia. I've yeah. played a lot of Lugia, so it's not also particularly that hard to play Lugia compared to all these other decks. So um, that's kind of where I'm at, at with uh, with Lugia. Yeah, it's always going to be a high roll deck. You kind of just have to embrace it. Just it is what it is, right? Um, my build of Lugia that I was actually playing the last like couple weeks had a few Carmines. It had about I think it was like three or four Carmines, mm. and it actually felt really good going turn one. Like I felt like I uh, I kind of like bought myself an extra turn to kind of brick out if I needed to. Like just having turn one Carmine going first basically said like, all right, if I don't have anything in my next hand, then whatever, I have another another hand refresh to kind of go about it that way. So I've liked that to help the consistency a little bit. I also do think that your your control matchup is actually quite strong uh, with the double jamming tower. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is like the, uh, I know we said we were going to talk 
touch on Wellspring Mask a little bit, but you have so many legacy energy users uh, now. I guess your list only only boasts two, but in general, like you you have like the whole card pool at your disposal. So you have a lot of different tool attackers. Um, uh, why don't we touch on Wellspring Mask while we're here? Actually, what what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, just, I don't think it's needed. Um, I mean, like most people will just bench Manaphy against you, even if you don't play it. Um, mm-hmm. So like that's fine, and like. Uh, if you start with it, it's really bad. It has like very little health for two prizer. Um, even if you take stuff out, like they're just gonna like knock it over two right back because the energy is shuffled back to the deck, so t- they still take yep. two. Um, it just feels like a win more card. Like there are some times where you can surprise your opponent and pull it out. Like I'm not 100 percent opposed to playing the card. I just haven't found the the need for it yet, in my opinion. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, like I I've actually really liked it into stall. It feels really good into mm. Snorlax. Because you keep recycling your legacy energy away from Giacomo and like all that stuff. So you they actually don't have much counterplay to that. Um if you're hitting a hundred plus one twenty, like they can't penny both. So you're eventually taking some prizes and it's also a good like kind of utility attacker to have on the board. Like I find against Snorlax, like especially with the pe- pressure of flute now as well. Um against Snorlax and Pidgeot, you're f- trying to fill your board ASAP because you don't want those like you don't want fish Sinnoh, you don't want hands down there. Like there's a lot of issues with that. So uh the wellspring mass has been a really good like just kind of bench sitter there so there are a few applications for it i think overall i agree with you i think it's not probably not worth the slot um not worth the hassle of all that but it's definitely kind of cute and if somebody's able to to break it 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 actually could be quite strong um the other thing i'd want to point out to anybody looking to play lugia is look at the utility of mincino um and i'm not even talking about the 60 hp i'm talking about the 70 hp um, I have used cleaning up a lot of the time to win against all as well. Uh, it is a very good attack. They can't do a whole lot about it if you put it on the bench. Um, they're going to put Bravery Charms down. They're going to put down Heroes Capes. And if you're able to clean those up and, and then evolve into Chinchino when you need to, um, it's actually really, really strong. So don't look past that. Um, it's also really good into Gardevoir. If you're not able to find your Gregoramic Towers, you can kind of just take KOs from discarding Bravery Charms off balloons. So... Keep an eye out for that as well. I think Lugia is very well balanced. Uh, I like the choice at number one. I do think a lot of people are going to be playing it, however. So yep. with that comes some counterplay, as you mentioned. 100%. If you're ready for some mirrors, back, back to the yeah. Slow Tempest. Actually, it's not Slow Tempest. It's like the format we had last year, like after rotation. I think Lugia will be similar levels of popularity, or popular. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think I think Blood Moon like almost pushes it over the edge a little bit, and then you add Legacy Energy, and the deck just feels strong. So Yeah, Blood Moon's a great, I great like it. card. Um even like in control, Blood Moon feels great when they can play like the Bravery Charm or the Cape on it. Just make it feel like a monster. So Yeah. Scary, man. Scary. I also realize we've gone like uh what, like 30, 40 minutes now at this point. We haven't made like any like sports references, no jokes. Like know, bro. we're just we're we're on business today, bro. This is the <laughs> biggest term of the year coming up. We're on business. We're serious for our listeners um, today. Yeah, we're actually serious for once. <laughs> Um, all right, let's hop into my number one. Uh, this is Gardevoir. We touched on this already. I will save you all the boredom of hearing it again. Um, there are a few changes in my list. You will look at my list and you will say this is a very greedy list and you would be absolutely correct. Um, I play one Dark Energy. Karen, I know you also played one Dark Energy. Yeah. Um, I only play one TM Evo in Space for a Rare Candy in saying, hey, if I prize it, I prize it. Um, and then I also do not play uh, the Clef Key. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, play, know I don't the... play Clef Key either. I sent you the wrong one. Oh, do you not? I thought there was a... No, I sent you the wrong one first. Oh, nice. Don't worry, I sent you the right one. Okay, sick. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, so there's... there's, I can confirm there's no clef key in there. Um, And that collapsed could be really be anything. Um, It is a collapsed right now, but you have a lot of utility to it. Um, The one thing I wanted to point out while I was looking at this right now in front of me is Gardevoir Mirror, which is um, going to be something you probably see a lot if you're playing Gardevoir. It is different to how it used to be, for sure. Um, the, take some time to learn it is would be my advice. I played my first Guardian Mirror like not long ago, and it really opened my eyes to it. And after playing it, I spent some time thinking about it. And I don't think about anything when it comes to Pokemon. I'm just like, yo, whatever. Like We're just going to play the game. Uh, but I, I thought, let's put a couple hours in this. Let's think about it. So the way the mirror works is a little bit different now. So there is going to be a point in time where your lines are going to get scuffed. Like your board is going to be scuffed. You'll be like, that, this turn sucked. Between one and six prizes, at some point, one of your turns is going to suck. And that's something that I found wasn't always consistent with the previous Gardevoirs. You had a lot more draw power through Arcana. Like, there was a lot more going on. Um, You are able to dig things out a little bit easier. Now you will find that there are some awkward turns. And I've actually found overall, it's better to fall behind. Uh, Just the utility of Countercatcher, the pressure you're putting on from just being able to KO the X at any point has been really, really strong. Um, That being said, your one boss is as important as it ever has been. 
Um, it was always important. That was the first card you check in Mirror prior to rotation, uh, and it still should be because that is your only way of killing an EX, especially if you go ahead. So the idea behind the Rare Candy is that you can take a more aggressive line into Gardevoir Mirror if you feel like you have the means to do it. So by that, I'm saying you have your boss. You have all the things you need to kind of be successful there. Um, if you're able to keep your boss till the last turn, it's a lot harder for them now to to collapse off the Gardevoir with less draw power and with unfair stamp if you time it correctly. It's a lot harder for them to um, to pull that off and, and get rid of their Gardevoir before you're able to take it out for game. So a lot of different lines now. Uh, a lot of thought I've put into this. Uh, definitely take some time to learn it would be my my biggest advice. And, and, and don't underestimate how powerful Monkey Dory can be as well. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, yeah, Garden Warrior is interesting. Like, there's a lot of cool things now. Uh, one play that I think a lot of people I don't, people might know, but like you can like uh, like gust up Guardi EX and Flutter Main, and the only way they can receive yeah. is if they Turo, if it doesn't have an energy, which I thought is really funny. Um, Screamtail is a little bit like sketch because if you put forty on it, if, it, if the opponent counter catches like something like Curlia, and they go like Monkey Dory thirty to it, they can take double knockout. That's another cool play you can do in the mirror. Uh, Crest is obviously good in the mirror. The other thing in the mirror too is like if you leave extra damage on your opponent's board, like you're leaving them damage for Monkey Dory and Crest as well. Um, so yeah. it is really interesting. Uh, the mirror match it has some elements of like the old mirror match where like you're like trying to wait to maybe like take a big knockout on Gardevoir EX. Um, what's it called? The uh, reversal energy play isn't there anymore. Um, but yeah, it's a cool mirror match. Uh, one of the more like chess like mirror matches we have in the format. It's not just like who goes first and like gets the first knockout. So. Um, yeah, you also play, yeah. I think Turo is another interesting card in the list that can be good in mirror, and like you play Palpad and else you can get it back. Um, yeah. I also play Palpad, so, uh, yeah, no, I think it's a fun matchup, I think Guardi's a great deck. Uh, like you said, it can be, a, my only problem with Guardi is it can be a little bricky sometimes if you don't get, like, that Evo off, or, like, you just don't get a great opening hand. Uh, I also don't mm -hmm. like how, like, we don't play as many ball cards as, like, the old guard of our used to play. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, no fog crystal sucks. Uh, I mean, like, well, yeah, no level ball sucks too, but yeah. it's all good. I I do think there's a couple mirror uh, mirror tracks you can put in as well. Like, if you need to, like, you can look at things like Jirachi. Maybe you can look at uh, there's a couple of different things avenues you can kind of go yeah, down. Vacuum. I don't maybe a vacuum. Yeah, there's. I just don't think there's a lot of need to do that if you know how to play the matchup. Like, you can kind of outskill people a lot of the time. Uh, you are kind of at the mercy of what your deck gives you and what you're getting off on fair stamp. I think there's a way you have to set up your board now that's very different to what it used to be. Um, just because unfair stamp is so strong. And like, I got hit with a turn like three unfair stamp the other day. And I basically just lost on the spot because <laughs> I had like one Curlia and you time an unfair stamp with a Cresselia killing the Curlia. Like that is dirty, dirty, dirty yep. plays. So uh, a lot of, a lot of skill that can kind of go into it. And yeah, so a lot of, a lot of moving parts. This would be my number one pick for NAIC. Um, had it not been hyped to all hell this last week, I definitely <laughs> would have played it had I been going. Um, I do think now with all the hype, I I, I don't want to say I would steer away from this. This is still a very, very strong archetype, but definitely be a bit more wary of uh, potential techs coming your way. So I think all the all the decks we covered here are, are good shouts. Um, you can't really go wrong with any of them, especially the, the also like the other thing that I think is really important is understanding what your goals are. Right. And we've talked about this before. But understanding, like, hey, uh, I'm a for fun player. I don't care about points. I want to win the tournament. I think that approach is a little bit different, too. I need a top 512 to secure my invite. So consider that as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I'm normally, like, don't go into a tournament and try and be like, oh, I'm trying to make 512. But we're at the point of the year where, yeah. like, if you need your invite, you need 512. All right, your goal is 512. Uh, yeah. So I would steer you towards a more consistent tier one deck. Like, honestly, Lightning Lugia is probably the best pick if you just need something like that. Um, so... Yeah. yeah that's, that's any uh, any advice? Last second advice for anyone going this weekend? Uh, no, just have fun. I mean, the meta is going to be interesting. I think. Um, study. I would say study like all the decks that have been like doing well online. Just try and find what the most common trends and and popular lists are, so you have a general idea of what you're probably up against when you sit across the deck. Since we don't really have like a staple list for each of them yet. Um, also, I, I didn't know this, Neil, but this is going to be the only major tournament in this format because there's like a mini set coming up for Worlds. Yeah, that is correct. So enjoy this format, yeah. I guess, while it's here. 
<laughs> enjoy like the five seconds of this format i think the the other thing as well is like keep keep attention to what is the most popular like i don't want to say bot deck i don't like use that term but like um keep pay attention to what the most popular bot decks are i guess i'll just use that term for now um just because naic in general is a very huge event we all know this is, is a lot of people um there's a lot of people and, and maybe in your circles you don't see this as much but there's a lot of casual people that are going to be popping out for this event there always is um there's always a good like i don't know i don't, I don't want to put a percentage on it because i don't know but i, I would say like five to six hundred people who don't would not play normal events who are going to come to this event to, just to play for fun right those people that are like me i guess in 2015 2016 where i'm like i don't play the game i'm just gonna pop up for the for the big events um and those people are generally going to gravitate towards like these more simpler like big boom decks that are more accessible to them as well and easier to pick up so at ICs, always our thing has been like counter the best deck, but also pay attention to like the Maridons and the like right now it's Raging Bolts. Like pay attention to the Raging Bolts of the world. You are going to have a lot of people on that, um, especially a lot of people who aren't maybe as up to date with Pokemon as as normal. So um, that's important. A lot of Poke Dads, a lot of Poke Moms, like just in general, just be nice to people, man. Like have fun. Like this is just an IC. It's, it's, it's meant there to uh, to be fun. This is our pinnacle in North America. So. Really enjoy it. Biggest tournament ever outside of Japan, I believe. But I feel like we're saying that every other week. So I'm not sure how much merit that still holds. Yeah. Is it actually going to be the biggest tournament outside of Japan ever? 3,600. Okay, so it is. Nice. I mean, like, yeah. I'm sure next year we'll break that again. So. Exactly, yeah. So, <laughs> it's, I mean, it doesn't really mean much anymore. That's still cool. Um, It is cool. I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty interesting to see the way the game has grown and so fast, right? So been awesome uh so uh, that is it for us actually really very relatively short episode to yeah. compare to what we're used to but we're just on business today we want to get you guys the info that we're kind of willing to broadcast here um take take these decks with a grain of salt uh enjoy your testing the last few days here and, and just just be uh be efficient where you can you're running out of time here so if you're cramming cram fast skip work take a day off call in sick you know yeah. call in sick that's don't, what don't, i like don't, to encourage don't use your vacation <laughs> Don't use your vacation days. Yeah, exactly. Stay safe in New Orleans too. There's always um always an aspect of that. So is it? <laughs> yeah, okay, definitely. True. There's I mean, a... I think that's a lot of the regional cities. <laughs> I've heard some mixed reviews in New Orleans. Okay. I'll say that. I'll, I've, I'll be... I've heard a lot more concern from my American counterparts about okay. this one compared to past I'll ones. Be on high alert, then, Daniel. I don't want to. I'll yes. make sure I get back so I can continue doing a shift gear podcast. Yeah, you don't want to get robbed outside of a Chick Fil A or whatever. I mean, I in, uh, I where was it? In so I won't have to worry. <laughs> <laughs> in Indy, someone got robbed at like a Subway or something, or a Chick Fil A, like right outside oh, the venue, no, right after seen day that. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice, so, uh, so don't do that. Yeah. Right. Anyways, all right, y'all, have fun. Uh, enjoy NAC. We'll we will be back the weekend after, provided Kieran makes it back in one piece. We will yeah. have another episode of the Shift Gear podcast. All Best right. of luck, everyone. All right. Peace. See you guys later.